Okay, so we're going to start now. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alexander Black, who's uh, going to tell us about uh, this joint work. All right, so uh, I will also be talking about the shadow vertex pivot rule. I would say um, I'm one of those four or five geometers who would endorse the shadow vertex pivot rule. Uh, so actually my, my work for this project is, is joint with both Jesus and Laura who are organizers and Sean who will be presenting the other half of what's going on with this project right after me. So um, I appreciate them for letting me represent us uh, at this workshop. So just so we can smoothly transition back into it. Uh, we're going to be still talking about the simplex method, and I'll be talking about it from a purely geometric viewpoint. The idea is I'm going to be, uh, if I want to optimize some linear program, if I want to solve it, I'll walk along the uh, vertices of the graph of the polytope, and I'll be walking from edge to edge. Uh, our objective function do some orientation, so I'll be, I won't be thinking of Tableau, but everything that I do in this talk can be translated actually into the language of Tableau. So to start there. And the other thing I want to mention on this slide is that we are always going to be talking about a polytope in which the number of variables is n and the dimension is d. So that will become important later on. So maybe internalize that. So for the simplex method, there are many different potential paths you can take. Uh, a pivot rule is just a way of deciding that path. And so the idea, I guess, behind the shadow vertex pivot rule is you have one objective function, and that gives you an orientation of your graph. So that's where the arrows come from in the picture. And then you have another objective function that you want to choose your path somehow. And you can imagine doing this in a bunch of different ways. But in our case, if you have two objective functions that actually induces a projection, it makes it so you cast a shadow. And the shadow is exactly the image of your polytope under a map, and the map is you project so that your x-coordinate becomes a dot prodding with one vector, and then your y-coordinate corresponds to dot prodding with your objective function. So the way I tend to think about this is that I have one objective function that induces the orientation, and there's the actual thing I want to optimize. And the thing that induces the orientation is moving from left to right, and the thing that I actually want to optimize is moving from bottom to top. So I want to find the topmost point, and that's what's pictured in here. So this is the edge I'd follow, and it corresponds up upstairs. So actually, people tend to think about this as shadows, but I like to think about it as drawing your, your polytope in two dimensions. So I have an octahedron here, and if I want to draw my octahedron in two dimensions, one thing I can do is I can just apply my chosen projection map to each of the vertices, and then I get ticks to draw the edges between them. And that's exactly how I drew this picture. And again, then moving to the right will correspond to increasing with one objective function. And then moving upward will be corresponding to increasing with the other objective function. And that's the, the one upward is the one we want to optimize. So then we get the shadow vertex pivot rule. So I told you it corresponds to walking on the shadow but you need a way to actually make a decision. I'm at a vertex, where do I go next? So it's actually pretty easy to see from the picture how you make this decision. So you want, you, you start on the boundary of your polytope in the shadow, and you want to walk to another vertex that's still on the boundary. So what you can do is you can maximize the slope among all possible edges outgoing from your starting vertex. So as you can see here in the picture, the red edge is the edge of high slope. So that's the one we choose. And the great thing about that is you can actually implicitly maximize slope just by using the parameters going on upstairs. So I don't ever have to actually compute the projection. All I need to do is maximize slope among all my outgoing edges. So there's one uh, unfortunate caveat that we have to deal with with the shadow vertex rule. So we can't necessarily do shadow vertex for any pair C and V from any starting vertex. So we, we have to choose. So we have our objective function C that's given to us. We have no control over what happens there. We have to make it there somehow. However, we have some control over what our auxiliary objective function is, but we need to choose it so that it is, um, 
it, it, basically so that our starting vertex is in the right spot. So the right spot means it has to be the C maximum on the V minimal face. Oftentimes what you do is you just make it so it's the unique minimum of V. So you have to start at the unique V minimum to walk across top. And in the picture here, I can show you exactly what happens when you don't do that. So if I start at this red vertex, I maximize my slope, I'll end up stuck all the way to the right. But I, so I, that will allow me to actually make my way up to this purple optimal vertex. So this is key for understanding what's going on with the, the shadow vertex pivot rule. So um, uh, before I move on, uh, this will be critical to understand what's going on here since my perspective is a little bit different from Daniel's. Does anyone have questions on this? All right, so um, I'll move on. So we're not actually going to be talking about a pivot rule for general linear programming. We're gonna be looking at a very special kind of polytope. We're gonna be looking at zero one polytopes. So these are linear programs on polytopes in which all the vertices, all the base field solutions are vectors in which their coordinates are either zero or one. So lots of polytopes from combinatorial optimization are like that, and we'll even be talking about them a little bit later on. So in our paper, we define two new pivot rules, the slim shadow vertex pivot rule, which will, will um, work as sort of choosing a nice shadow. So um, we'll give you an exact way to choose a good shadow to follow. And it'll, otherwise it'll be exact like general shadow. So it's about choosing a nice V from any given starting vertex. And then there's the ordered shadows vertex pivot rule, which is instead of choosing one nice shadow, we'll basically systematically keep following different shadows until we reach the optimum. So um, also, uh, for the remainder of the talk, and the thing I need you to keep in mind is we do prove some general results about shadow vertex. And when we do so, we will always mark our polytope as Q, but some uh, many of our results are only for the case of zero one polytopes. And in that case, we'll mark a polytope as a P. So keep that in mind as you, as you are watching and reading. So, all right, um, let me get down to our results. Why is it interesting to define these pivot rules? So for slim shadow and ordered shadow, we get linear bounds on the length of number of non-degenerate steps that the simplex method will take. So our first linear bound is linear in the number of variables. So we always take at most the number of variables non-degenerate steps. But this is why I distinguish earlier between N and D because the ordered shadow vertex pivot rule gets a tighter bound uh, at the actual dimension of the polytope. So in general, these two can be quite different, but both bounds are actually tight. And to make it explicit what I mean by them being tight. So um, it, the Hirsch conjecture, which was described in Daniel's talk is known for zero one polytopes. And if you describe the Hirsch conjecture for zero one polytopes, it is suffice to prove that the... We may wanna fix that. Who wants to ask a question? I think it was just me. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, all right, so as I was saying, for zero one polytopes, if you want to prove the Hirsch conjecture, all you need to do is prove that the diameter of a zero one polytope is bounded by its dimension. And this is, has been known for more than 30 years. However, you know, despite knowing this, we've never found a pivot rule until this, these results that actually attains that bound. So diameters do not equal actual pivot rules that find the paths. And even more so, um, so our bound is linear. Daniel presented lots of known bounds in his, his talk. Um, from, to my knowledge, there's no other large class of polytopes in which we have linear bounds. And in fact, I will show you a little later that we can get sublinear in certain cases. So, all right. So that's the first thing I want to note. And the other thing I want to note is it, it has been proven by uh, people in, in geometric combinatorics um, that for a, there are zero one polytopes for which you can get a shadow with exponentially many vertices. So we knew that there are these cubes in which this happens and they're pathological or whatever, but it actually if even zero one polytopes have bad shadows, but the point is not only, it, it, we may have bad shadows, but I can actually give you a deterministic way to always find a good shadow from any starting vertex. So that's the, the key idea. So let me define the slim shadow vertex pivot rule. 
So the way I promised I tell you it works is I, you give me a starting vertex, that vertex is X naught, and then I give you a choice of V in terms of just that starting vertex. In this case, it's just one minus two times that starting vertex, where one is, is the vector of all ones. And then all we do, all that's written here is we apply general shadow vertex rule exactly as you do. So you maximize the slope at each step. It's just for this particular choice of V. So I tell you the way to choose V, and it turns out for this choice of V, we always take at most N steps. So that's the, the key idea. How do we choose a good V? So um, let me show you on the cube, and this can somewhat illustrate what's going on. So this is a, a picture of the cube. Again, I drew this by, I, I figured out and computed the projection for this choice of C and V, and then I, I drew it in ticks. Um, using those coordinates. And so when I do that, I can actually just look at the picture and, and easily draw the shadow path. So the shadow path here to optimize negative two, one, three is highlighted in red. And um, the reason why I knew ahead of time it was going to be short is because I, choose v, I chose V uh, with respect to the sh uh, slim shadow pivot rule. And in this case, V is the sum of coordinates. And the thing to note with the sum of coordinates, uh, so V transpose, when you apply it, when you take the dot product to a, a vector, is the sum of coordinates. Okay. V is the vector of all ones. So when you dot product with another vector, you take the sum of the coordinates to clarify what I said. So because when you dot product with V, all you're doing is taking the sum of coordinates, that means that there are only N plus one different slices of basically when you apply the value of V. So uh, the n plus one slices are given by the different number of non-zero coordinates for each of your vertices. So you can only pass through uh, one slice at each step of the path. The path is therefore of length at most n. So let me formalize a little bit why, oh, what this comes from. So there is a, we can prove a general lemma about the, the shadow vertex pivot rule. And the, the proof, you can actually see it just by looking at this. So say we take our projection and we get this polygon. So I told you earlier, when you move to the right, you increase with V. And when you move upward, you increase with C. As you, at your, from your starting point to your maximum, you increase to the right and you increase upward, which means the path we take is not only increasing with respect to our objective function, like most of our paths are, we're actually able to choose another objective function for which it increases with respect to. So if we're able to find some sort of nice objective function in which all monotone paths are short for whatever reason, so then we're able to impose that um, the path we find here is short. So the key here is um, when you do a shadow path, it's actually monotone with respect to both the objective functions you choose. So the way we're able to get the bound is um, it, essentially, so it's, it has to be C monotone and V monotone has to be increasing with respect to both objective functions. In particular, the auxiliary objective function value, this V transpose value must change at each step. So if V transpose X takes on few values, then your path is short. And you can do this for whatever objective function you want to optimize. And the proof uh, of the slim shadow bound is exactly this. All I observe is this objective function is particularly nice. And um, to give you an idea of how I choose this objective function, so you, on the cube, it, it's clear that if we take the objective function given by all ones, that things will work. All this does is it rotates the cube so that you're starting at zero, essentially. So that's where this other objective function choice comes from. So from this, we're able to attain a linear bound for slim shadow vertex, but there's even better news. So um, if our zero one polytope is uniformly sparse, so the number of non-zero coordinates is constant. So for example, uh, the traveling salesman polytope, all vertices will have the same number of non-zero coordinates because of exactly what you're counting, similar for the Birkhoff polytope. So when we have that, uh, when we have a zero one polytope of that type, slim shadow vertex actually takes at most the number of non-zero coordinates um, number of steps. 
So I, I, you know, I gave you examples, but let me make it clear just how good these bounds are. So on a on these famous polytopes, traveling salesman polytope, asymmetric traveling salesman polytope, bear cuff and perfect, perfect matching, the bounds are not quite the best possible, but they're asymptotically best possible. In, per, in particular, they're off from a factor of two or three from the optimal bounds that Rispoli proved on their monotone diameter. Monotone diameter is like the diameter, but a little bit more specialized. Um, but all simplex paths have to be monotone, which means the monotone diameter is a lower bound than the best possible length of simplex paths. You have to say what, what you mean by cancer. Oh, yes. So um, for each of these, they have a, this parameter M um, will indicate a, a different thing. So for example, for Birkhoff polytope, um, when you study the diameter of the Birkhoff polytope, you're interested in the dimensions of your matrices. So the Birkhoff polytope is the set of permutation matrices, and permutation matrices are n by n, uh, m by m in this context. For TSP, it's the number of your points, uh, and for perfect matching, it's the perfect matching is on the complete graph with m vertices. Um, but you can even see without that labeling that the, the bounds are asymptotically optimal. But in particular, they are sublinear in terms of the dimension. So for a Birkhoff polytope, uh, the dimension is uh, asymptotically m squared. So our bound is actually sublinear. It's root the dimension. So, OK, that takes care of what we're able to find for slim shadow. I will move on to order shadow. Does anybody have any questions on slim shadow? Yes, Dan. Uh, so I was just curious, uh, I mean, is there any reason these, these bounds wouldn't extend to uh, like polytopes with vertices in, you know, zero one to the K as opposed to zero one? So that's a, it's a good and very natural question. Um, so the advantage of doing, uh, uh, when you're on a zero one polytope is that if I'm at a vertex, I can always find a good uh, orientation that's minimized uniquely at that vertex. If you start at a point in a zero K you know, lattice polytope, you no longer have that property. It's no, at least it's no longer immediate. How do I find my V? Uh, but it's a good question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Now let me talk about the other uh, pivot rule I want to describe. And I'll start by doing an example. So, you know, here's, here's the ordered shadow vertex path. Uh, I first draw it here. This is what it looks like. It, so this is the same uh, objective function. It's the same cube, but you'll note it takes a different path from the slim shadow path. So these are, are really different pivot rules. And let me show you exactly how I found this path so you can understand exactly what, how, this, how this works. So what I do is I first highlight, you know, my first, my starting vertex. And one thing I know is if I treat that starting vertex as a zero dimensional face, I'm on the maximum of that face because it's because it, that's the only thing there. But as you let the dimensions of face go up, that becomes a little bit more trivial. So if I move to an edge, so I take this edge, I know I'm the maximum on that edge. So I don't move anywhere. However, I may increase the dimension of the face. And now um, if I'm, uh, I'm not the maximum of the face, so I move to the maximum. And again, I, I do that for the whole polytope at this point, for the whole cube. And I look, am I the maximum of that face? Um, no, so I take the step and I'm able to move to the global maximum. So the key property that I wanted when I was trying to figure out the ordered shadow vertex rule is I wanted to be able to find uh, an increasing sequence of uh, faces. So each face is included in one other. This is called a flag, such that at each step, I'm always at the maximum of one of those faces. Since the dimension of the corresponding face has to change at each step you move, you end up getting that the path is of length at most D. 
And that's exactly where the bound for ordered shadow vertex comes from. And one way you can think of it is you're taking a new shadow at each step. So that, and that's sort of somewhat depicted in this picture. That's more in the justification. So let me show you exactly how I define this rule because I, I need to give you a computational way to have a rule that has the property I want, which is that there's a flag that I basically associate with the path from the maximum each step. So the way the orange shadow vertex rule does, it works, it's actually kind of similar to uh, the slim shadow rule in that we sort of define what we do in terms of our starting point, and we keep that uh, definition with us throughout. So I define this function j, and uh, let's, for, for simplicity of explanation, suppose our starting point is zero, then what j does is it finds the coordinate, the largest coordinate, uh, largest index um, that is non-zero. So we don't care about the actual value at that index. All we care is, is it zero or is it not? So j returns that value. And what I, I force myself to do is I don't look at all of my neighbors. I only look at my neighbors that minimize j. And so what this is in notation is a way of forcing us to always stay on the, on the face until we finish what we have to do there. So basically what this does is if I'm, I look at the smallest face in my flag that I'm not already the maximum of, and I maximize on that face. And minimizing J is exactly how we do that. So that's the, the general idea for how, how to do it. So J sort of forces us to take care of what you have to do in lower dimensions before moving on to higher dimensions. And it just so happens that by using the lemma I have from earlier, I'm able to argue that this gives a path of the desired type. So, all right, and that's actually uh, all I have to uh, say on this. So I'll, I'll leave it here and leave room for lots of questions.